I don't really talk about micronutrients a lot because there is, a, as you know, there's a lot of interest in other nutrients such as phosphorus, nitrogen, and other. So I, I thought this will be a good place to sort of revisit uh, that we do have some of the micronutrient issues. Uh, but before I get started, let me ask you, have you ever seen micronutrient deficiencies in any of your crops? What's the most common micro that you use? Okay, okay, good. So, so you're gonna like what I have to say. <laughs> so um, I sort of split my talk into, into four components and I think sometimes when we talk, we, so we need to keep in context that where do micros fit in? So in the first section, we're gonna talk about some of the essential micronutrients that plants need. Um, then we'll talk about some of the micronutrient, and we dig a little bit deeper into why we have some of the micronutrient deficiencies now that were not 20 years ago, or what will the future be look like. And then we'll spend some more time on talking about three micronutrients that are sort of major where we see some deficiencies. And, and I t uh, threw sulfur in it because many times we sort of have forgotten sulfur over the years. So there's a need to sort of learn why we are here and why do we have some of those issues. Um, and then finally we talk about why the soil testing for micros has not been as successful as with phosphorus and potassium. So with that, um, we know we have three main nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. So think of them as your main meals, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Uh, then we have secondary nutrients, calcium, magnesium, sulfur. So those are like snacks, midday snacks. Um, and I'm sure you all hear that doctors tell you you need to take your vitamins and minerals. So that's where these sort of micronutrients fit in. And there are about seven and eight of those. Um, most of the time, some of the micros such as nickel and chlorine, you're never going to see any deficiency unless there are some unique circumstances. Uh, some of them that you will see is boron definitely pops up. Uh, manganese also shows up. Uh, another common one is zinc that you will see in, in some places. So we know that plants need all these nutrients in different amounts to grow and you know, to be healthy. And in, in your case, you want to make sure that you get the yield that you want uh, and that yield is not limited because a micronutrient is limiting in the soils. So this slide sort of puts into perspective that if you take a plant, for example, and you analyze how much nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium you will see, so more than about one person. And then we have secondary, which is a little bit lower. That's why we call them secondary. When you come to micronutrients, these are parts per million. So they're really, really tiny amounts. But plants do need them for different functions, which we will talk about in a minute. This is another way sort of to look at it and I think an example I'm gonna give is that these are all micros on top. So if you look into the relative importance of nutrients for plants, so, so if you are a plant, you need nitrogen about 30 times more than sulfur. But that doesn't mean sulfur is not needed, right? So plants still need sulfur. Um, another example is that plants need nitrogen 1,000 times more than manganese that also means that plants still need manganese. So you can go up the chain and see this is really, really tiny amount, but plants do really need it. So coming into, this is sort of, you know, the, the eight or nine different micronutrients. They are required in small amount. So here just reiterating the importance of these micronutrients. They play critical role in plant growth and function. And although they are needed in tiny amounts, plants still need them. So we need to make sure that they are present in sufficient amounts in the soils when plants are growing. So this is, so if you take a sample, a surface sample up to six inches, <coughs> in most soils you're gonna find that there is a, in, in this example, that the boron in soils could be anywhere from 20 pounds to 200 pounds in the surface six inches. And you can go down the list that nickel, for example, you may have 10 to 2,000. So other way to look at would be that soils have these microbes that can last anywhere from 100 to 200 years, right? So which means that as we start growing crops and other things after 100 or 200 years, 
we're going to run out of supply. This is what's present in the soil. And we have been growing crops for a longer period of time than most of the time we think. So there is a, over a period of time, plants will take up, they will get depleted. The second column here sort of shows, and I'm going to come back to that several times, that with all these micronutrients, if you look at these amounts are pounds per acre. So it's less than one pound in one acre that most of the crops will remove. But if they take about you know, less than one pound, and you can multiply that with you know, less, about 200 years, you're going to run out of that. Uh, so when we talk about some of the micronutrient deficiencies, they do occur. They don't, they're not present in all the fields. So the best way to sort of know is look at some of the conditions that may promote a deficiency. And here are some examples. If your soils have high pH, you can pretty much guess that there will be some micronutrient deficiencies. And we'll come back to that why. Uh, some of the highly weathered soils that we don't have here, but they are on the western part of the state, um, that's where some of the micronutrient deficiencies show up because these soils have low pH. Another common theme that you have in eastern shore is low organic matter coarse, coarse textured soils. That's, that's, another, that's another situation where micronutrient deficiencies will exist. Um, and another, another example is muck soils are very high organic matter soils. So you need organic matter, but not in muck soils. Um, and finally, this, this is actually a very good way to look at it. If you have a field that never received any manure, you're probably going to pay close attention to micronutrients, because that's where you will see some deficiencies. And I will come back to that, that why. Although we may not have that issue in many of the fields when we get to the lower shore, um, in this mid-shore or upper shore, we do have some fields that never received any manure. So that's another something to keep in mind. So high pH, very low pH, low organic matter. If you have any of the soils that fall into these categories, call Jenny. <laughs> so now let's say that, <laughs> and then she will get in touch with us. So looking at some of the micronutrient deficiencies in field is very hard. You know, because there are a lot of things going on. Uh, there are other factors that can cause symptoms that just look like micronutrients. So every time you see, hopefully after this talk, if you see a different color in the plant, just don't assume it's micronutrient deficiency. It could be something else. But some of the things to rule out would be pay attention to weather and temperature is very critical because that cause symptoms that look like nutrient deficiency and it might not be. Some of the disease and insect damage may look like it's a, it's a deficiency. It may not be. So I'm going to give you a clue how to find it, right? So that's the forensic fun stuff. So if you're in field and if this is your plant, and then you see that there is some yellowing and some other colors on the lower leaves, it's not micros. So your micros always show up in the top leaves. And the reason why is that some of the nutrients move in the plant. So when the plant takes up and it's in the lower leaves, and then the plant realizes, hey, I need some nitrogen on the top leaves, this nitrogen will move from top from lower leaves to top of leaves. And that's why you see as corn start maturing, the lower leaves turn yellow. So it's not they're dying, it's a nitrogen that's being moved or translocated from lower part to the upper part. So the micronutrients are very different. So once you have micro, they don't move, they stick around. And when they stick around and when there's not enough micros in the soil, the new leaves need micros. So that's where you see that all the micronutrient deficiencies show up on, on top leaves. Uh, if you need, Jenny can give you this slide so you can keep a printout in your, in your pocket when you go and you can take a picture. Yeah, you have the slides, so do whatever you need to do. Uh, so talking about pH and nutrient availability, there's a strong connection. So we know that all the, our major nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, if we have very acidic soils, and we're looking at 4 pH, you're going to see deficiencies. Um, and in, in those soils, most of the micronutrients are going to actually be enough because of the chemistry of micronutrients. Uh, if the trouble is when you get into high pH, more than salmon, then you begin to see some of the deficiency symptoms. So before you do anything, pH is, again, you go to a doctor and he checks your pulse 
and he doesn't use that information anywhere, right? So he checked temperature, he doesn't use anywhere, but it's a quick diagnostic to see if there is anything that's imbalanced. So pH is really good and it's cheap and it's easy to measure pH. So if you have a pH between six to seven and assuming other factors play and you're not gonna see a whole lot of deficiencies, but if pH is less than six or more than seven, um, then you probably need to do a little bit more diagnostic to see what could be wrong with, with this field. So moving into the other parts, so we're gonna talk about uh, sulfur, and then we'll talk about three micros. So we know that among all the you know, nitrogen, potassium, sulfur is the one that's the micro, or sec it's a secondary micronutrient uh, that plants still need it, but not as high as nitrogen and phosphorus. So sulfur in, in soils uh, is taken up by plants as a as a anion, and it's called sulfate ion. Um, and the plants, it, it serves a very useful function all the amino acids and proteins that plants need to sort of grow and make, they need sulfur. All the green stuff that you see in the plants, it's chlorophyll, just like nitrogen. So if there's a sulfur deficiency, as you will see in the following slides, uh, the first thing you're gonna see is yellowing of the leaves because it, it's, it's chlorophyll molecules. If there's not enough sulfur, it won't be as green. Um, and in legumes such as soya bean, it helps with the nodules. So no, those nodules help fix atmospheric nitrogen. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a really important sort of a micro, uh, in this case, secondary nutrient that plants need. So when there is a deficiency of sulfur, adding sulfur, you will see that, look at how dark these colors are. So if you look at any of the vegetable group in general, they have very dark color. Uh, and partly because they have a huge sulfur need compared with most other plants. Uh, if you also look at soybean leaves, for example, compared with the corn, soybean leaves are much darker. Uh, and that's why soybean has a more need for sulfur than, than, than corn. Uh, and again, it also helps with the nitrogen use by plants more effectively. It, it, because sulfur, it also contains a lot of amino acids, so it also helps to improve sort of diet of the animals. So it's, re, it's really good for animal nutrition. So this is where the alfa, alfalfa is another crop that has a high um, sulfur need in, in, in addition to other vegetable groups. So where does most of the sulfur in soils come from? Anyone? Soil, organic matter, right? So if, if we look into, if this is a pool of sulfate in the soil, this is the only pool that plants can take up and you can go along and this is organic matter is the main source of sulfur in soils. Um, another is uh, we also have a little bit iron and aluminum that can also fix a little bit of sulfate. So it's mineralization of organic matter um, that, play, that provides most of the sulfur for plants. And then a little bit of sulfur is sort of fixed in the soils. And since this is, sulfate is just like, somewhat like nitrate, it also leaches. So if you look nitrogen here and sulfate, and uh, um, your nitrogen and phosphorus here, sulfur is kind of in the middle. So some of the sulfur leaches, some of that is also fixed like phosphorus. So it's in between um, those two nutrients. So when you have a deficiency, this is why you're gonna see yellowing because there's not enough sulfur, which is a central molecule of chlorophyll that plants have. So the symptoms are very similar to nitrogen with one exception, location, location, location. So here is a good example. So if you look in corn, this is a sulfur deficient corn because sulfur doesn't move in the plants, you are always gonna see on the top leaves. Compare that with corn, and it, this is all yellow, but it's on the lower leaves. So, which means that this is nitrogen deficient. Uh, and this is, in, in this case, the reason why you see more yellowing on the lower leaves when corn start maturing is that plants are very clever. They know they need more nitrogen in the top leaves or for, for potting or for grain filling. So they have a way to sort of move nitrogen and sulfur that's on the lower leaves to the top, le top leaves. They can't do that with sulfur because it doesn't move in the plants. It stays where it is. So the, the places where you're gonna see sulfur deficiency again is low organic matter, sandy soils, that's gonna pop up many places. Low pH is another issue. If you have a cold, dry soils in spring, 
uh, sulfur deficiency can also be triggered just like with the nitrogen <coughs> deficiency. So when I was in grad school 15, 20 years ago, no one was talking about sulfur because we were getting a lot of sulfur free with the RAN. Right, so I'm sure some of you old timers uh, probably remember, no one probably was talking about sulfur because there was no need to. Just like we don't talk about nickel now, there's no need to. Uh, maybe in 30 years we will be talking about it. So um, what happened with all the power plants that we did a really good job cleaning it up and those scrubbers, if you don't believe in science, scrubbers are a great way to look at science because they worked. And they took all the sulfur that was going from coal power plants, and now we have to buy that sulfur from a coal power plants. So maybe you think it's a scheme, <laughs> right? So they took all the sulfur that was going in the rainfall, then we have Clean Air Act that really cleaned up all the air. And it's a good thing. If you've never been to China or other places, you see how much dust and sulfur is hanging around. So it's good, it increases our lifespan. That's another way to sort of look at it. So this is a kind of cool series of graphs. So the red is how much sulfur we were getting back in 1985. Uh, that's when clean air, clean air policy sort of started. Uh, this scale is metric, but one kilo per hectare is one pound per acre. So in other words, back then in the eastern part of the US, we were getting about 20 to 25 pounds of sulfate per acre. And as we sort of started implementing, you see the reds become yellows and the yellows become green. So if we fast forward to about 25 years, this is how it looks like. So the 20, 25 pounds per acre we were getting, we're not getting anymore. So that's why we sort of have a need to add sulfur in, in the soils. So just to sort of summarize, we have Clean Air Act. So uh, it's good for the environment. Uh, in some ways, bad that you have to buy it, but would you rather breathe air that's not clean? <laughs> I think it's always better to put 20 pounds in a field rather than trying to you know, inhale in the dust and other material. Some of the fertilizer composition also has changed. Uh, back then, there were a lot of fertilizers where sulfate was sort of present as an impurity because their, their process was not as clean. So we were also getting some sulfur in addition to some other fertilizers. And a good example is single superphosphate, which I don't think many folks use anymore. But if you use, another, another clue here is, if you use ammonium sulfate, you, you're adding sulfur into your soils, and you're never going to see sulfur deficiency over a long, long time. Another factor, we have a lot of hybrids. We also have higher crop yield that are removing more sulfur or sulfate from the soils than 30, 40 years ago. Um, and, you know, climate, like last year, we got a lot of rain. We got about 40, 100 inches of rain, and we get about 40 inches of rain in Maryland. So when you have more rain, sulfate can also leach just like nitrate. So th this, these are some of the factors that why, if you never see sulfur deficiency, uh, you may have some situations where you will have a problem. So another challenge with, with sulfate is that soil testing is not really a good way to figure out if you are, have a sulfur deficiency or you have a need for it. And the part of the reason is because sulfate behaves very similar to nitrogen. That's why we don't have a test for nitrogen. Uh, so we can't take a soil sample, test it, and see what we need. So same challenge with sulfur. So the main source, as we talked, is, the, is mineralization or release from the organic matter pool. Um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do soil test. Soil test is still useful. You can do sort of malic test. Uh, this is more to kind of keep an eye that do you have sulfur deficiency or not. So you can kind of keep an eye on it to see how the levels have sort of changing over a period of time. Uh, the best way to diagnose sul sulfur deficiency is plant testing. So by doing plant testing, you, can, you, can, you know that there is a need for it. Uh, and th there are a lot of tables that are published by different land-grant institutes, uh, which tells you what should be the sulfate content in the plants. And this depends on when you take soil sample. So again, feel free to call Jenny if you want to do any plant testing, and we can help you figure out what would be a good time to take a, take a sample. So 
let's say that you just guess that you have a sulfur deficiency, right? And you're like, I'm going to put some sulfur <laughs> back into the fields, which is you shouldn't do it. But if you really strongly feel that you have some deficiency, you can use this as a very preliminary guide. That for any grain crops, you can add 5 to 15 pounds of sulfur if you feel there is a need for Forage crops will need a little bit more because you're also going to take the straw out, which will be left behind with the grain crops. So again, when you expect a sulfur response, this is what you should apply, and this is because this is what crops will remove. And if you remember, this is the amount that we were getting with the rain early on. So that's why we need to kind of pay an attention, keep an eye on it. So. This is a graph for soybean, and this tells you how much is removed by soybean. So if you look at some of our recommendations uh, for most things, they are closely aligned with how much plants are going to take. So soybean, for example, will take about 20 to 25 pounds per acre. So if you're adding that amount of sulfate, if you have a need for it, you are in a good situation. Um, and again, like soil tests, why it's tricky is because sulfate moves. So if you have sandy or low, low fine texture or coarse texture soils like we have in Eastern Shore, you, have to, you probably want to do a test on the eight inches and then you want to do a little bit deeper test because what happens is that sulfate from the surface may move a little bit closer. So if you only analyze the surface layer, you may think, oh, I need sulfate, but because that sulfate moves in those sandy soils. So ideally, you want to do you know, a test in both depths uh, and then on that basis, you can, you can figure that out. If you have clay soils or heavy textured soils, just one sample from the surface is good because sulfate is not going to move because it's fixed by some of the other things that are in the clay or silt soil. So as a general guide, you can see our recommendation is about 20 pounds. Uh, we also have an extension publication on uh, recommendations. So all this information, we are updating that document. So. Uh, if you have a copy, previous copy, these are the same sort of guidelines. Nothing has sort of changed just yet. Uh, we have several options. Ammonium sulfate, gypsum is widely available, and some other options too if you, if you have a need for it. Um, coming back to manure. So if you, have, if you have fields where you apply manure or have used manure in the past, you, you never, you're not going to need uh, sulfur application. And this is because a one ton of poultry litter, for example, will add about five pounds of sulfur into your soils. So if you have added two, three tons every other year, or every three, four years, you're, you're pretty in good shape. You don't need to worry about uh, sulfate. OK, moving on to some of the micros. So zinc, zinc is another one that we see deficiency. And this is also. A, Again, needed in small amounts, but very useful for plants to do a lot of cool things. Um, and some of the deficiency symptoms are actually, you know, if you're not growing them, they kind of look cool. Like, look at some of the pattern, and it's uh, for, for some of the plant diagnostic. This is when they see everything green, it's not exciting. They like to see some different colors because so they can figure out what's needed. You probably don't want that in your field. Uh, so again, this is a, another micro, doesn't move in the plants. You're always going to see on the top leaves. But this will be one of the pattern that you will see. Uh, this is white, yellow discoloration. You're going to see striping on the leaves. Um, so it's, 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 it's kind of easy to identify, easy to figure out if it's zinc. Some of the conditions, low organic matter, sandy soils, which we have in Eastern Shore. Um, another thing is no recent manure. Zinc is also very interesting that if you are applying zinc at the same time as phosphorus fertilizer, don't do it. <laughs> because zinc's going to bind with the phosphate that you're applying with fertilizer, and it's going to form a mineral called zinc phosphate. So it's going to reduce zinc availability in that field and also phosphorus availability. So just remember that don't add zinc with phosphorus fertilizer at the same time. You can add other year when phosphorus is not added, um, then, then it's good. 
some more pictures and Jenny will have this talk. She can send it to you so you can sort of use as a guide. Uh, another sort of pattern is you see this white line in the middle of the leaf in corn. That's another clue uh, that there's not enough zinc. Some examples from soybean, and if you have extreme deficiency that I don't think you can ever see extreme, it will be very mild deficiency. You can have this white line going in the, in the leaf blade, and if you have that, that will be a good way to sort of figure out that it's, it's definitely zinc. So compared with the sulfate, Soil testing is pretty good for zinc and some other micros. Uh, one of the challenges, because the plants take a really tiny amount, so there has not been a lot of soil fertility research in terms of developing what we call a critical level, which means how much zinc level should be in the soil before we start adding micros. So that's one of the challenges. Um, plant testing is also a very good way. And this is an example from Penn State um, and if you look on the left side, it looks like this was, uh, you know, um, this was planted at a different time, but actually this was planted at the same time. Both of these fields have all other things with the exception of zinc. So the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, zinc can severely stunt plant growth if it's not present. So something to, to keep an eye out on. Um, if you look at which crops where you will see more zinc deficiency, so corn definitely pops in, and soybean is another one. Another one that you will see is alfalfa. Uh, and if you look on this side, this is less than one pound. So soybean at 75 bushels need less than one pound of zinc. So again, very, very small amount. Um, and if that's what plants are going to remove, and if you look at some of the, this is our application rate, that you can do a soil test, and if the pH is lower and you get some value, uh, which is less than 0.8 parts per million, that's when you want to think about doing some applications. And you have a couple of options. You can broadcast. When you broadcast, you always have to add more because plants are not everywhere. They are in the rows. If you are bending, you can reduce, you can do four pounds as compared with 10 pounds with the broadcasting. Um, and again, we talked about that, do not bend zinc with phosphorus fertilizer. So, um, and if you have high phosphorus soils, you can also look into foliar application, which is somewhat utilized if there's a really need for it. And that could, that could also help overcome um, some of the effects that you will see later in the season. Uh, some fertilizer option, this is the most common zinc sulfate, there's another liquid fertilizer that you can use, and again, I keep coming back to manure. Manure has a lot of zinc, so if you have field that received manure, uh, most likely you're not going to see zinc deficiency. Okay, moving to another one, manganese, that's, that's another micro, uh, very useful for plants, and plants need it to make sure they're growing and not stunted. Um, some deficiency symptoms that you see, there's general chlorosis, which means yellowing of the leaves. Uh, and many, again, this also has yellow-green striping, which looks like zinc, although zinc is a little bit different than manganese. Uh, if you look in soybean, you will see this, what's called intervenal, which means yellow color in between the veins. This is, again, immobile, doesn't move, always will be on the upper leaves, not on the lower leaves. So some examples, we talked about sandy soils, high pH soils, if you have a lot of wet soils, that can also uh, affect the uh, release of manganese. So in other words, your soil may have enough manganese, but if there are some other extreme climatic conditions, um, manganese may not be released from the soils in a timely way for plants to take up. So high organic matter, uh, the reason why high organic matter is kind of bad for micronutrients is because high organic matter binds micro, uh, micronutrients very closely, and it doesn't release it back. So in this case, we are looking for extreme organic matter, 20%, which we're not going to see in most situations unless you get into wetlands or swamps and other areas. So... Another way, this, is, this looks kind of beautiful, but this is not beautiful <laughs> in a field. It probably is good in a pot if you want to demonstrate deficiency symptoms. Soil testing is pretty good with the manganese as with zinc. Uh, plant analysis, very solid way to diagnose if you have uh, any deficiency. 
few more examples where you're going to see so you can carry this PowerPoint with you in the field <laughs> to see what might be going on. So some of the challenge with the manganese, if you see soya bean, you know, it, it depends on the soil situation. So in some soils, you may have a need for manganese. In some cases, maybe there is no deficiency. Um, and it's, it's because it's very strongly controlled by minerals in the soil and other things that are going on in the soil. Um, if you look at soybean, probably will take up about two pounds per acre in a year. So not, so not, a, so not, a, not a huge need. You don't need to add like 100 pounds of manganese. You need a couple of pounds. Uh, soil test is very good, so you can do soil test. You can add you know, a little bit in a row. You can also do foliar application, which is good, and I will come back to that foliar in a minute. So by the time, the challenge with most of the micronutrients is that by the time you're gonna get to the field and you're gonna diagnose and figure out there's a deficiency, it might be too late for that year to apply because if you go back and do some applications in the field, it will be a long time before those micronutrients become soluble and then plants will take up. So in, in some of those circumstances, when you know for sure that there is a deficiency, foliar application is a really good way to sort of apply or supply that micro in, in a very quick way uh, and it's not going to meet all the micro requirements because how much could you apply in foliar? We have limit, you know, we can't eat three lunches in a row, <laughs> right? It's the same thing with foliar. It's like you have to keep feeding it. So plants are like little babies. They need a lot of, you know, TLC. <laughs> um, so a couple options with fertilizers. Again, easy to find them. You don't need a whole amount. Um, you can manure is again very good. So just with, with we have some issues with zinc and phosphorus, not with the manganese. So if you're using manganese, you can band with uh, nitrogen phosphorus. Although I will still avoid with phosphorus because just because we don't know enough, manganese is very similar to zinc. Uh, so it's not in the literature because no one has done it. This is my guess that you shouldn't band phosphorus with manganese fertilizers. So another one, boron, is, is, is another tricky one. Um, and it, it's, so boron is kind of interesting micro. You want to apply it, but if you apply too much, it's going to kill the plants. <laughs> so you have to kind of keep an eye on it. Um, here are some other deficiency symptoms. The most common crop here you're going to see is alfalfa. Anyone grows alfalfa on this side? So pay attention. <laughs> So in alfalfa, you may have some boron deficiency. So a good example is that it looks like a word is used, rosetting, which means the top is really compressed. And it may look like there is some disease, or it could also be insect damage. But it could very well be boron deficiency in those situations. So the leaves, they will all do reddish yellow, which is very similar with, to with most micros. So, Another thing with boron is if you have a drought and you have, there's not enough rainfall, you will begin seeing some deficiency. And it's because if there's enough moisture in the soil, it can release boron. So in other words, soil may have enough boron, but there are other factors such as drought or more rainfall that can cause some of the deficiency symptoms, which otherwise you won't see in a normal year. High pH soils, bad for boron. Um, low organic matter is not good for boron. Sandy soils, as we have. So boron is also like sulfate. It leaches. And zinc and manganese, they don't leach. They just stick around in the soil. So it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's a lot to process that. Some leach, some don't leach. Uh, that's why you, you really need to give us a call if you see any of those issues, and we can help you diagnose it. Soil testing for boron, not very good because it leaches, just like sulfate does. Uh, there's another test that researchers use, but not many labs do it. Plant testing is very good for, micro, uh, for most of the micronutrients. And the, most, the crop where you will see deficiencies, alfalfa, um, you may have some issues in corn and soybean, but not as common as alfalfa. Another example here is that, this is example with soybean, about 75 bushels it will only remove less than one pond. 
So there's not a huge need to add a lot of boron back into the soil. Some more examples on how these symptoms look like if you have any deficiency. Um, and the crops where you will need is alfalfa, corn, and clovers may also have some of the deficiency symptoms. So you, a soil test, although not very good, but still useful indicator to, to know if there is a need for it uh, and some options that you're looking, but the most microbes, the highest that you should ever apply is about four to five pounds. With boron, it's even more tricky that if you apply three pounds, when you only need one pound, it can actually kill your seedlings. And we'll come back to that in a minute. So some of the fertilizer options, easily available, a uh, couple options here. So this is where, let's say that if you are doing any banding of boron and you have corn seeds sitting right next to it, it could be toxic to the seeds. So just pay attention to, to boron. Um, that the best way is to apply very little if you have a need for it to begin with. So here is, I'm, I'm gonna take an example here that there's a long, list of all the nutrients that plants need, and we'll pick on some of the big ones, uh, micro. These values are kilograms per hectare, so one kilo per hectare is about one pound per acre. So again, this is soybean, about 75 bushels, so everything is in hundreds, and we're looking at 100 pounds. By the time you get into the micros, this is in grams, so this is all less than one pound, with the exception of manganese, about two pounds. Uh, and iron about four pounds. So everything is really tiny. Plants don't need a whole lot of it to begin with. Just to I keep coming back to this because I would hate for you to, to grab a 100 pound bag of micronutrients and put in your fields. So just very, very tiny. You don't need a whole lot. And this is the removal by 200 bushel corn and 75 bushel soybean, less than one pound for most of the microbes. So. When we look at soil testing, we haven't been very successful with, with micronutrients. And there are a couple of challenges. Uh, this is a data that John Spargo made up. <laughs> this is not real data, but he said he has seen many data which just look like this, that there's no correlation with the soil test level uh, compared with the yield uh, because of the challenge that we have with the microbes. There are tiny amounts, and it's hard to find fields that will respond positively to uh, micronutrient application. So the question is, why should you do any soil testing if soil testing is not good, right? So, so we'll spend a few minutes uh, talking about this and concluding it. So what can you learn from soil testing reports? A couple of things. I think that the best thing to kind of sort of diagnose either any deficiency symptoms for plants or even with the humans is look for, did they do anything you know, weird, <laughs> or something that I don't normally do. And th in this example, this will be very high pH. Um, if there is excessive phosphorus application, and we have some soils that have high phosphorus, so that can cause some of the micronutrient uh, problems. Low organic matter, so if you don't fit into these three categories, and you use manure in the field, you are not gonna see micro deficiencies. So here is my suggestion. If you have fields that don't fit into these situations, do soil tests once. You will know what's in the soil. And then keep an eye on it and do a soil test every three to five years. So that will be a good way to know if you will eventually have any deficiency symptoms. And the reason for that is by the time you're gonna diagnose, it will be too late for that year. So it's a, you need to be sort of proactive. Keep an eye on the, on the soil nutrient level uh, micronutrient level to make sure that there are enough in the soil uh, and they will be available when plants need them. So another way good is that if you don't want to go out and take a lot of soil samples, especially when it's cold, or other, other ways you can sort of do a routine plant analysis that if you see that oh, this field might have an issue, you can take a plant sample, which is relatively easy to take than soil sample. And you can send it to lab, and that will be a good way to see that if there could be any need in future. And some of the plant analysis could also be good because sometimes plants have what we call hidden hunger. Um, it's like, remember, you just eat a meal, but you're still hungry. <laughs> so 
it, that, that's, that's an analogy that plants may need it, but those symptoms may not be manifested in a way because sometimes it's too late, the, you know, all the things are go gone, the grain is there, you, you're never gonna know if there's a deficiency. So plant testing is another good way to sort of keep an eye on it. So here are some examples that this is uh, no way endorsement of Penn State Lab. They have some cool <laughs> um, s graphics that they display in soil testing reports. So this is an analysis of different micros, and you can see if the levels are normal, you know, you're pretty good. And every three to five years, you can do another plant analysis to see if there could be any need. So I think that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions now or later. <coughs> Thank you. Good morning, everybody. As Jenny said, my name is Samantha Steele. I am a loan officer with Farm Credit out of our Denton, Maryland office. Um, I do see a lot of familiar faces in here, which is great. But for those who don't know what Farm Credit is, we are a full service lender that specializes specifically in ag and works specifically with farmers. Um, we offer uh, real estate loans, operating loans, and we also uh, offer equipment loans and something that you might find at your local dealerships called Farm Credit Express. It's an option to apply for loans right at the dealership and the loan comes through right to your loan officer as if you came into the office, but it's a quicker service to help our customers. Um, we're also a cooperative, which means we return a portion of our profits every year to our borrowers. So uh, for a few of you who are Farm Credit customers, you probably got a check here in the last week. Uh, so happy March to you. <laughs> Um, we realize farming's a tough business, and when the going gets tough, we'll be here. So please stop by one of our offices. We have one in Chestertown, Dover, Denton, um, just to be, name a few that are close to you. Uh, we have a booth here, so if you have any questions, please feel free to stop by and talk to us. Thanks. My name is Mark Horst. I'm with uh, Power Ag. It's a company out of uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It was developed to supply needs of micronutrients to farmers. It was uh, they were dissatisfied with their source of uh, micronutrients that they were getting, and so they decided they're going to go on their own and do their and uh, get their own uh, micronutrient packages, and that's what they did. And it's uh, the very they use top shelf products. And uh, stop by the booth; I'll be happy to talk to you about them. One of them is uh, is the Mega Power, which is a uh, a sulfur and a zinc product. You can mix it right with your 1034 oil right in your planter. Uh, it does not it's not going to bind with the phosphorus like the former speaker was talking because it is a EDTA chelated zinc so it works very well with your starter. Um, another one that I'd like to talk to you about is the pepper spray. That is a very interesting one. It's one that we use on, uh, on uh, corn and soybeans especially where you're going to see a lot of deer damage and uh, the idea is to, to spray it on. It's made with, uh, it's made with uh, hot pepper and garlic smells horrible if you, if you spill it on yourself you will know it so uh, be careful with it but it is uh, it works it does uh, it does get the deer to uh, to move to the neighbor's crop and that's kind of what you're after get them to go to the neighbors so uh, it lasts probably about it depends on our weather patterns but it usually lasts about two weeks two to three weeks and so it's uh, so it you're gonna have to reapply it um, the idea is to get it the plant growing in those critical growth stages to get the deer into a pattern where they're moving somewhere else. So if you have a lot of deer pressure, stop by the booth. I'll be happy to talk to you about it. So you might be pretty busy. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you. Thanks. Mark.